Well, hello everyone and welcome to this new webinar series on mesh generation with SimScale. My name is Arno and I would like first of all to thank you all for joining us today. So uh, let's get started. Uh, a little bit more about myself first. Uh, my name is Arno Gian. I'm a customer success engineer here at SimScale. I'm uh, mostly uh, by trade a mechanical design engineer with, uh, with a few years of experience. Uh, designing uh, different uh, product components like uh, valves and pumps, uh, all type of machines, and mainly using CFD and FEA uh, as a tool to uh, to enhance and uh, performance and to assess uh, efficient the efficiency of systems. Uh, let's first talk about um, SimScale and uh, who we are. So uh, we've been founded in uh, 2012. So we've just um, uh, celebrated our uh, uh, anniversary uh, just recently. We are mainly based in the in Munich, but we also have uh, offices in Boston and New York. At the moment, we're growing fast with over uh, 80 employees across uh, six time zone, and these um, we have a huge range of users uh, in the world, and they uh, can access uh, a lot of simulation projects. Uh, uh, and we have a huge community growing as well. So uh, what does SimScale do? Uh, SimScale is specialized uh, as a platform for engineering simulation and uh, deal, mainly dealing with a within the same uh, environment with fluid dynamics, solid mechanics and thermodynamics. So what it means is that uh, within the same uh, project you can run a CFD simulation but also a, a solid mechanics simulation and everything is accessible through your uh, web browser. So that makes it really accessible and at SimScale we're trying to make your simulation experience uh, as accessible and as simple as possible. Okay, so let's dive into today's topic. And um, today's topic, as opposed to um, various webinars we, we've had done before, is not specifically uh, targeted towards a, a type of analysis, but more uh, towards a, um, a stage of the simulation process. And the, sim the stage is called mesh generation. So this is uh, a compulsory st um, uh, stage that you will have to go through when you run your simulation, uh, whether it is be, uh, could be with uh, CFD or FEA. And uh, we're going to try to understand um, why this um, meshing uh, important, what is this, what, and, and what is it uh, that uh, makes it uh, a good tool to use uh, for, for simulation. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, the quality uh, of the of a mesh and what what does that mean and how do you control it, and I'm going to then introduce um, our standard measure, the the SimScale new measure, and talk about how it works and uh, how we can make the best uh, out of this uh, very very powerful tool. And lastly, I'll, I'll uh, go with you on the platform. I'll show you a couple of best practices and show you uh, the type of things uh, that you should avoid when creating a mesh. And uh, let's dive in uh, the uh, first uh, part of uh, this meshing setup. So let's talk about what is a mesh in engineering simulation. Why do we need to have this step between setting up the uh, importing the CAD model and, and, and starting the simulation. So a mesh is a division of a volume, so a volume of a pressure vessel for example, and uh, divided into smaller elements, smaller volumes called elements. So why do we need to do that? So let's take a, few, uh, a simple example um, that concerns a CFD case, but it's also uh, valid for, for an FEA case. So let's say we want to analyze the flow uh, in this pipe, and we have a, a set condition, which is a uh, flow rate inside, uh, coming inside the, this, uh, this pipe. And we're trying to evaluate, oh, how much... Uh, how much water comes out of the upper pipe and how much water comes out on the uh, main pipe. And th the bad news is we cannot use a simple equation like an analytical uh, way of solving something which would be a function of the inlet flow rate 
and the location of uh, one of the outlets. Unfortunately, the, the laws of physics and the development uh, of, of, the, of the engineering simulation field doesn't allow us to analytically solve this kind of problem. Uh, the flow is, gener is um, governed by different equations depending on the, uh, on the uh, approach you're making. And these equations at the moment cannot be solved analytically. There's, by the way, uh, a price uh, for you if you want to try to solve these equations called the Navier-Stokes equations. And there's a price of $1 million if you uh, are uh, able to solve analytically these equations. So um, good luck. And <laughs> let's see uh, if one day uh, this is going to be uh, uh, solvable. So what we can do, however, uh, because we cannot analytically solve these equations like this, we're going to subdivide this volume that we are interested in, where the flow is going to develop. Uh, we're going to subdivide this volume of water inside the pipe into smaller elements. And then in these small elements, we are going to, to be able to solve the flow equations, like the velocity or the pressure, in these in this tiny elements, as you can see here. So we know uh, on, the, on the entrance that we have a certain uh, flow rate. And then we're going to calculate uh, the velocity, the pressure in the first volume. Once we know this in the first volume, we can then move on to the next uh, volume and so on and so forth. And this is exactly uh, the principle behind uh, CFD analysis. And it works in a very uh, similar way uh, for FEA analysis. So I hope this makes sense. Uh, this is essentially what this, this meshing allows the solver to do. Okay, so how we for, how we're going to divide uh, this main volume? We're going to divide it, as I said, in smaller elements. And uh, there are different types of elements that uh, can be produced by the mesher. These depend on the type of application, so a CFD or FEA. It depends on the precision you want to have. It depends also on the, um, the complexity of the surface uh, that you're trying to make your, um, um, your, your simulation on. So we have the hex element, which is essentially uh, a cube, uh, a tetrahedral element, a prism element, and a pyramid element. The main two ones are the hexahedral um, element and the tetrahedral element. So um, keep in mind uh, that these elements shown here are of somewhat a uh, very um, ideal case element where you see that the edges of our uh, elements of, are of uh, equal length from one to another. So keep that in mind for the next part where we're going to talk about uh, quality of matching. So these are the more or less ideal elements uh, that we're looking for uh, to be uh, in our mesh. Okay, so now let's talk about the mesh quality. Uh, there are two main things uh, when, it's about, um, when it's about assessing the quality of a mesh. And the first one is, as I said before, we are going to be able to uh, assess how close each element is uh, in terms of its, of its proportion, I, close to an, an ideal element. So if an, an element is very squeezed, for example, uh, it's not going to be uh, to have good proportion and then um, the mesh quality uh, will be uh, worsened. Then we have the relative smoothness between the elements and this really is dictated by the fact that we have two elements together uh, with that shares a face, one, one element on one side and the other one on the other side and we're trying to see how smooth the transition is. So how, for example, the, uh, the volume between one and the other is going to be. So if one is very, very massive element and the other one is very small, then we have a problem. So we have to have a kind of a smooth transition between one to another. So why are we assessing these? These are very important factors because the solver will run in a smoother way with less uh, calculation and less computational effort with a good quality mesh when the elements all have the right proportion and when they are smooth compared to each other. So if we make sure that these are uh, maintained to a reasonable uh, scale, I'll, I'll tell you later what you, what you will be looking after, uh, 
then uh, um, then we can uh, make sure that we can ensure that the, the simulation is going to run uh, smoother and will run into uh, less problems. Okay, so let's talk about the few. I'm, I'm not going to uh, talk about too much about uh, all the different factors that uh, all the different metrics that allows us to um, make um, a good quality mesh. Just the main ones, the most important ones, and the ones that you can check within the SimScale platform. So the first one is the aspect ratio, and this dictates the uh, uh, is dictated by the shortest edge to the longest edge of one single element. Uh, and then uh, we can see that uh, this ratio uh, can be really poor and then the, we have a highly squeezed element and on the right hand side we have a very uh, ideal uh, scenario where all the edges are uh, the same and the same length. This is what again what, you, what you're looking for. Second we're going to have a look at the angles. Uh, this is basically it's a very simple matrix so we're just uh, calculating the, the angle between, uh, checking the angle between uh, two edges. So uh, for triangular and tetrahedral element, we're looking at a, an equilateral uh, element of with 60 degrees uh, of angle between the edges. And for quads and x elements, uh, we're going to uh, have a, a square angle. So the, the closer the closest we are to these two values, the better our um, uh, element quality is going to be. Okay, the last one is going to be uh, the volume ratio. And again, this is the second part of our uh, mesh assessment uh, for the quality. Uh, that's the ratio of the two uh, volumes of two elements um, adjacent to each other. And it's just the, simply the ratio of uh, uh, the larger volume of the element to the smaller volume of uh, uh, the, the other element. So the larger, the, the, the larger this ratio is, the worse your, um, your the quality is going to be. So you have a look uh, at, at this uh, quality factor as well in your result. Okay, so how do we check all these values, all these uh, quality metrics? So if you are in your simulation tree, you can have access, once you populated a mesh, you can have access to a meshing log and you can access it from the tree as you, as you can see uh, on this slide here. So you, we can have a look at four main uh, quality factors, so the tet edge ratio, the volume ratio, the quad max angle, and uh, the uh, triangular max angle. So this is the, these are the, the metrics we've, we've checked before. Um, ideally, so we know that for the angles, we want to maintain this between uh, uh, close to 60 degrees for certain type of, uh, of uh, elements and 90 degrees for other type of elements. For the other ones, we want to make sure that we're as close as possible uh, to one for uh, the dead set ratio and for the volume ratio we want to minimize this uh, as much as possible. Um, in terms of values, uh, of, co of course for the touch edge ratio you want to be as close as possible to one and for the volume ratio you also want to be within the few hundreds. You would, I wouldn't recommend you guys to run a mesh when you, ch you check your volume ratio and it's above let's say 1000 or 900. So ch check the max values for, uh, for each of your um, metrics. Okay, um, now we're going to talk about uh, the new measure. So uh, you see that the two, uh, the, at the moment we have two main uh, meshing algorithm uh, on the platform and this is um, something that we, uh, we try to um, make, uh, make it very accessible again. Uh, we have a two type of, uh, of mesh uh, generated for, for this specific geometry. So uh, our new mesher is able to really uh, handle uh, complex, uh, complex geometries and really tackle uh, smaller, um, smaller edges and really capture well and refine automatically uh, what's happening on, uh, on the, the geometry. The other one, the traditional X-dominant mesh, can also be useful in some cases, but uh, we're not going to focus uh, on to, uh, this one at the moment. Uh, but it can still be useful if you want to check uh, the quality of, uh, of, a, of a simulation and if you want to uh, really uh, experiment with uh, a mesh independent studies, for example. Okay, um, let's 
move on to uh, what, how the, how the uh, standard measure works. So basically, um, when we have, for example, uh, a geometry where uh, we have different, uh, different solids in it, and this is the case of what you see here, um, the, uh, the individual solids are going to be uh, meshed uh, with a certain, uh, certain type of parameters. So um, for the solid, you see that we have a duct uh, in orange, for example. Uh, this duct is a solid, um, is a solid way, is a solid uh, that is going to be meshed mainly uh, with um, tetrahedral element or pyramid element, and uh, the rest is going to be uh, different on uh, depending on what uh, type of parameters you've applied to. So let's say, for example, our uh, the, the surface that of our meshing is going to be uh, of triangle uh, elements on the surface. And this is the face of the prism or the tetrahedral element that, that you see, basically. You see that the small details have been captured. So the, the, the cell size is going to be automatically uh, uh, adjusted to really capture smaller, uh, smaller entities. Uh, and then we can have a look at the fluid that is going to be uh, um, meshed. And it's, it, this is meshed um, um, slightly differently, um, where we have uh, a boundary layer that connects the fluid region to the, uh, the ducting, so the, the walls. And we're going to talk about this uh, in a moment. And then at the core, we have hex, hexahedral element. Uh, so we're combining the different types, as, as we saw before, the different types of elements uh, in order to make the best out of from, from what the solver is capable of solving uh, more efficiently and also trying to capture um, the geometry as in a very robust way. So trying to uh, do some kind of a trade-off between these two, uh, these two factors. And to connect the, um, the boundary layer to uh, the hex element, we have a combination of pyramid and tetrahedral element in between. Okay, um, let's have a look into uh, the measure options. Uh, this, the, tradition, the, the standard uh, options the, that appears when you click on the measure. So, uh, depending on if you are with CFD or FEA, one option is going to be different. But in a general way, you can um, as you can have the uh, first line is going to be the algorithm used, so you use the standard algorithm. And for the uh, sizing, you would leave it to automatic and the finest to five. So these two, uh, two settings, the, the basic settings, I would recommend that you use them uh, as a first start and see uh, how your mesh looks like. And then uh, you can play around a bit further with uh, with more options, but it is it's always a good starting point to leave the sizing as automatic and the finest to five. Uh, after, depending if you are in a CAD case or an FEA case, you would have the option to use the X element core like like you we've seen before on the on the previous slide, and you can use second order elements, which are elements that have more nodes, and that concerns mostly FEA cases. And this is uh, when you want to have more precision in your, in your results. However, if you use second order element, the, the, uh, the solution is going to be uh, a bit more uh, tricky to converge. And um, that, that's also the, the counterpart of having uh, more nodes. OK. Um, I want to talk about a small um, addition in terms of features that uh, the SimScope generation process uh, uh, has in, uh, implemented very very recently. I think it was it was around this uh, this week. We can now, uh, as a community user, uh, automatically uh, have the number of processor selected, and that uh, really um, select the number of processor depending on the complexity of the geometry and and the uh, and the fineness. So you don't have to worry about selecting the, the right amount of processors. This is going to be automatically. Uh, computed in the background. So th that's a very good news. For pro users, you can uh, still uh, access the uh, number of processors uh, in, a, in a more manual way. So from uh, up to 96 uh, 
uh, processes for the for this uh, meshing process. Okay, um, we're not we're not going to talk about uh, advanced settings. And the first thing I want to talk about uh, regarding this um, this meshing algorithm is going to be uh, the um, small feature suppression. Uh, this is a very useful feature I find where you have, uh, as you see here, when you have two edges that are really, really uh, close to each other and we want to uh, really make sure that uh, the fact that um, these edges are really, really uh, close to each other, like 0 0.1 millimeter. Uh, the, the fact, the, the way the algorithm is, uh, works, it's going to be to, to capture everything between these two, um, between these, uh, these two edges and therefore create really high uh, aspect ratio, as you can see here. The thing is, uh, especially for this case, uh, we don't need to have these two edges captured. So uh, what we can do is enable the small feature suppression and set it up to a, to a value that, that is a bit uh, larger uh, than the, the edge distance. And this allows us to, uh, for, the, for the algorithm to completely ignore uh, this, uh, this tiny gap and therefore um, create less uh, as, uh, high aspect ratio elements. And this is what you see here. You see it has created like more uh, of a high proportion, and nicely um, proportioned elements in our result. And you see the uh, quality is, is a lot higher uh, to what uh, we had before. Okay, uh, let's talk about the uh, next feature, which is called uh, uh, number of gap elements. This is a new addition uh, also to the, to the new measure. Uh, to our standard measure. Um, this uh, really allows you to uh, capture what is happening uh, within, for example, uh, the fin of a heatsink or uh, a small gap where you want to know uh, what's happening at different uh, uh, thickness around, uh, uh, around this, uh, this fin. So basically you don't want to only have one element, but you want to have one or two or more uh, more element across the gap in order to really uh, make sure everything is, is captured fully. This is very useful when you have, uh, yeah, as I said, a heatsink for electronics cooling, for example. So this gap element, you're going to be able to choose it as a ratio uh, between the gap length and the element edge length. And this is, uh, this is how it's been defined. So when it's set to zero, you, again, you have really high aspect ratio elements and you're not capturing, capturing fully what's happening. So, if we increase uh, that ratio, we're going to be able to uh, cut down uh, one edge uh, length um, with proportion to the gap length, and this allows us to make to have more elements uh, in between uh, in between the, the two faces of the gap. Okay. Um, so now we've seen that the the main uh, the, the advanced features uh, of of this standard measure. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, mesh refinement. Uh, what a, what is a mesh refinement and why do we need them? I uh, previously mentioned that uh, some geometries, some ent entities of the geometries, will be refined uh, automatically depending on the edge that we're going to capture and 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 things and things like this. So. There is a little bit of part of the algorithm that is intelligently selecting and targeting small entities, but you will need to make sure that your mesh is fine enough to be able to capture what is happening within uh, the flow distribution, for example, or the stress uh, pattern in your part. So, for example, uh, how do we know uh, when a mesh is refined enough? You see on the left-hand side we have a very coarse mesh, uh, you can see actually the elements, so the, the, the solution is calculated, as I mentioned before, the solution of the flow is calculated in each element, and you can actually tell, uh, tell where, the, where the elements are, but on the right hand side, it's refined enough that, that you don't really, you can't really tell where, where the elements are visible and where they're not. So that is the, the, the level of, uh, of refinement you want to be at. The idea is really to capture uh, important uh, parameters and the important aspect of your uh, of your solution. 
So we can re refine the the uh, the edge length, uh, the edge of the elements according to a surface. So we all, I can only select, uh, I can select, a, I can pick a face and um, assign a maximum edge length for a specific set of surfaces. Then I can do the same for a specific region. So this will uh, involve the creation of uh, a geometry primitive. And it can be a cube or a sphere or a cylinder. And then within that cube uh, or geometry primitive in, in general, uh, the maximum edge length of a specific uh, value will be respected. And an important type of refinement that this standard measure offers is uh, what I mentioned before, the inflate boundary layer. And this is put in place uh, within uh, as, a, as a typical refinement method to really capture uh, what is uh, happening when the fluid uh, reaches uh, is at the interface between uh, is, is reaching the interface where a wall starts. Because the fluid will travel at a certain uh, velocity, uh, at reaching the wall, it will gradually slow down to a, to a smaller values. And we really want to capture this effect of the velocity uh, going uh, down to zero uh, where it meets the wall. So to, this is important because uh, we're going to, uh, this is going to ensure that we have correct solution uh, for our analysis. Uh, we're going to predict better reaction forces, uh, the heat exchange, for example, if you want to analyze the exchange rate between a fluid and a solid, is going to be much, much, much improved. And obviously, uh, the pressure drop and friction uh, values will be also more accurate. Uh, so you might ask now, uh, but how many layers do I need? Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the height of this, of this whole thing uh, uh, that, that, that would allow me to uh, really capture what is happening? Um, so there's a, there's a whole topic about this. Uh, this is called, obviously, uh, the viscous boundary layer uh, topic uh, where there are different uh, parameters that will allow you to, uh, to, to select the right parameters. But uh, to put it simple, uh, there's different factors to, that, that influence this, uh, this setting. So this is the velocity, uh, the type of fluid you're going to use, so that the, vis the viscosity, and obviously uh, the turbulence intensity of that fluid going inside that region. So I think we're going to make another document or another webinar on that specific topic because it's, it's quite big and uh, it would, um, yeah, we would need more time to spend on it. But uh, very quickly, uh, I can show you a couple of uh, uh, ways of defining these layers. So uh, we're going to define a number of layers. First of all, this is our first option. And the second option is going to be uh, the overall thickness. So this is a ratio between the, the adjacent uh, cell below and and the overall uh, uh, thickness of so if, if we have 1 and 0 0.4, then uh, that's going to be 40% of the uh, edge length of our uh, element below. And then we can either select a growth rate, growth rate sorry, from one element, uh, from one layer to the other. And the second option is to define the first layer thickness or the first layer height. Okay. Uh, what I want to show you now is uh, how we access this uh, from uh, the platform. All right, uh, let's dive into the platform and see and see what happens. I wanted to show you a couple of uh, a couple of things. Okay, um, the first thing I want to show you is this uh, small feature selection. Uh, where you have a small feature suppression uh, value of zero, and you see that you have a really bad uh, dead aspect ratio. If I go to my meshing log here, I go all the way down and I have my dead edge ratio which is really high and my uh, dead aspect ratio which is, which is also really high. And this is the thing um, that you don't want uh, to run and this would induce um, like unstable result and, um, and really uh, I wouldn't recommend that you go ahead with, um, with this type of, of mesh quality. So make sure that before you run uh, a simulation, make sure the, the, the tet uh, ratio and all these metrics are, are, are maintained uh, within reasonable, result, reasonable uh, values. Okay, so if I change this, I can actually uh, duplicate 
um, this uh, match here and uh, and then use the same parameters but only change this uh, small feature suppression value to a value of 0 0.2 and then you can see that our uh, TET aspect ratio is then much much more different and let's have a look into the meshing log okay uh, so the TET aspect ratio has massively uh, dropped as well as the uh, the edge ratio. Okay, uh, second thing I want to uh, dive into is our different types of refinement. So uh, we have a look at this uh, region refinement for example and I can uh, show you the original uh, mesh with no actual refinement. You see that it's still going to be uh, trying to capture small curvatures and small edges in our geometry and the local size uh, element, uh, I can uh, go to my refinement here and I can actually see the face I've picked and selected a specific, a specific edge length and you see that only the surface here and around it because obviously uh, you remember that the, uh, the transition has to be smooth so we're trying to maintain the smoothness between that face that I've refined and the uh, outer part of the measure. Uh, so we've seen the region refinement and I want to show you the boundary layer that I've selected only on a few faces. You can see it here. Here it's follow, it follows a certain uh, type of edges. And I've selected uh, yeah, a few faces uh, to really have these boundary layers off. Um, as, a, as, a, as a main uh, recommendation, you can use uh, the default settings for these uh, inflate boundary layers and they would work in a, in a lot of cases. Okay, the last uh, bit I want to show you is the actual process of uh, creating a mesh. And this is a typical example that I want to uh, run with you. Um, this is actually um, um, a typical case of uh, electronic schooling and this is the uh, uh, printed board a PCB or uh, I think it's uh, a 3D printer and we can have actually a look at what the geometry looks like and it's actually being simplified like this. So this is what we're trying to match and we're trying to, ca to capture all these uh, heat sink details and we're trying to capture all these blocks and everything. So if I go to my mesh and I've started, uh, let's have a look, uh, I started with my standard measure uh, at, uh, as I said before, recommended settings, so automatic and five. And um, I can have a look at my meshing log. So with the mesh I generated with this automatic settings. And you can see that um, the TET aspect ratio is not great. And the uh, TET edge ratio is also not great. So what I did, is uh, going down the route of uh, trying to refine it and trying to find a good quality mesh. Uh, I went to uh, a measure uh, at size 6. Let's see what it looks like. We obviously ha have more uh, element in our, uh, in our mesh, you see, 8.1 uh, million. I can go to my mesh log and consult uh, the uh, the log again. So I'm, I'm scrolling all the way down and I can see that the TET aspect ratio has uh, changed and we are uh, still bad in the TET edge ratio. So this means we are still not at a very good level of quality and I again wouldn't recommend that uh, this, this, uh, mesh, uh, this mesh to be run basically. My last attempt was uh, to set this uh, at the value of 7 and let's have a look at the mesh log down here. I go all the way down. This is how uh, the log is populated and you see that my TET aspect ratio is a lot better. My, uh, my angles are a lot better and also I have a really good TET edge ratio. In this configuration, I could be more confident uh, in running a simulation and uh, this will improve uh, dramatically uh, the accuracy of the, of the solution and obviously uh, the stability of the solution. Okay, uh, let's go back to our presentation. Okay, I have a first question and the question is, uh, what's your proceeding when the meshing fails? 
So um, the meshing fails, um, it's um, in most cases uh, would be uh, determined by the fact that this, there's something wrong with the geometry. Of course, it depends. Uh, it depends also of, uh, uh, of, of of what your intention is. But um, the geometry uh, it would probably fail where you have like really really tiny tiny element and uh, tiny edges. Sorry, or uh, when there's some faulty geometry. So it's it could be mainly due to um, a bad geometry. That that's what happens most most of the time. So make sure you have. Uh, some some good quality geometry being imported, so we wouldn't want to have shells or 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 really tiny surfaces that uh, that the the algorithm will be trying to catch and where it's not really necessary. A second question: uh, What would be the best way to mesh really thin elements that would normally be meshed with a shell? That is a very good question, and it's very relevant to uh, the current situation. Uh, because uh, uh, simulating uh, really thin, uh, really thin elements and really thin geometries, we can actually dictate uh, this by uh, assigning the um, gap element meshing, uh, the, the, the number of gap elements, and this is the, the the setting we've seen before, and this is also applicable for uh, for FEA cases. So you'll be able to select one, two, three, four uh, elements within the, the thickness of your uh, of your mesh and then you can um, therefore calculate something a bit more accurately. Exactly like, uh, yeah, it you would capture what's happening within this, the thickness of your uh, of your shell. Is it possible to check the orth orthogonal quality of the mesh? So, um, it is uh, for this specific um, meshing algorithm. We haven't uh, deployed the, uh, the, the the capability to check this this quality. However, uh, you can in other cases check this uh, this quality metric. Absolutely, but it's not uh, it's not shown at the moment in our mesh log for this measure. Okay, let's. Do, wow, we have a lot of questions. Thank you, guys. <laughs> A uh, very interesting question as well, why not to automate so that the mesher will always bring numbers within required value? This is the type of things that we would like to uh, to implement in the future. So there will be uh, a, another, an, an extra layer of, uh, of automatic refinement. So let's say we're, we're generating a mesh and we see that we can check the, the quality values uh, and then if it's, if it's not satisfactory, then we would uh, refine automatically. This is one of the things we are considering for uh, the development of the meshing of Sim, within SimScale. If you have any other um, um, feedback or any other ideas on how we can uh, develop uh, the, the meshing tool, feel, feel free to leave us a comment and feel free to also ask, uh, ask uh, other questions. There is no real limit on the uh, number of elements and nodes within the SimCell community. However, you have a limited uh, uh, computational power available, so it might uh, somehow limit uh, your computing capacity uh, when you have a community version. Yes, again, we have um, the, the, the way the measure uh, is, uh, is, is designed, uh, it only shows a few of the quality metrics and this is uh, something that we have uh, purely selected uh, because we think it's uh, the, the most relevant. But obviously there are more uh, ways of checking uh, like this Kunes or uh, the taper angle and things like this, obviously, yes. All right, uh, thank you very, very much guys for, for uh, joining this webinar. Uh, I hope you've learned something. Feel free to uh, leave us any comments. I just wanted to uh, give uh, a big shout out to our meshing team who uh, helped me a lot on preparing this webinar for you. I hope you will find this helpful. I hope you will use uh, this, this measure because I think it's very powerful. It's uh, actually twice as powerful on average than the standard measure, so feel, please feel free to, to use it and tell us what you think and tell us what your experience is. Uh, I'll say uh, goodbye for now and I hope I'll see you again in the next webinar. Thank you all for, for following and see you in the next one.